I want to actually start with a very interesting story and then we'll segue into the topic. Uh, many years ago, a new restaurant opened in Chennai and it was at the time when Chennai was not exactly known for having too many interesting restaurants and this restaurant was called New Yorker. And one of the items on the menu, and I still remember this one item from that menu, it was a Jain Mexican falafel sizzler. Okay. Mexican because it had grilled capsicum, onions, chilies, you know, oregano maybe, right? And uh, falafel because it literally had falafel as part of that. And sizzler because it came with a sound, sound effect and all that. And Jain because it did not have uh, uh, potatoes and other things. The weird thing was the Mexican part did add onion. But somehow they still called it Jain. So in any case, so I, on that note, Jainism. The re I think it's, it's one of those things where uh, it's one of the major religions of the subcontinent. Also a religion that I think uh, very few people who are not Jains uh, might understand. Um, but most people like me and like many people in the audience I suspect kind of know Jain food yeah. because it's everywhere. So maybe I want you to sort of give us some interesting things about what are we missing here? Yeah. You see, I also realize that for most people, when they talk about Jainism, their access to Jainism is through food. So it's Jain pizza or Jain pav bhaji. And Bombay especially has a very strong Jain culture. And so people are always looking at this Jain menu. When you travel in international flights, there's a Jain meal. Yes. So uh, you also know that you're dealing with a very affluent community, right? extremely affluent community and whose presence is there in, for most people through food. Um, and I thought that uh, we need to know a little bit more about Jainism and I wrote this book which sort of discusses the mythology of Jainism uh, in keeping with my desire to understand mythologies from around the world, not just Indian mythology but world mythology. Uh, although people assume I write only on Hindu mythology but I write on all mythologies and you compare and contrast and therefore, you know, the topic today was about food, you know, when your name came up and we said, okay, let's, can I have a conversation? And I wanted to meet you for a long time. <laughs> so <laughs> this is, uh, uh, an, you know, the lit fest and an opportunity where authors yeah, can exactly, meet and yes. we have been, I think, Twitter friends, yes. you know, dealing with the same trolls. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, food uh, is an important part. And in Jainism, one of the things that is very powerful in Jainism is the notion of fasting. You fast a lot and in, in, in Karnataka, people don't realize Jain is, uh, in Karnataka has a very strong Jain traditions and there's something called a Nishidhi stones. These people didn't just fast, they would fast unto death. Yes. And they would prepare for that and that's an idea that is a very dif difficult idea to fathom. Yeah. We know the pleasure of food, right? Eating food is so pleasurable, so joyful. And yet there is an entire worldview which is rejecting food and is, you know, staying away from food. And what it is doing is saying that I want to fast to the point that I die. So I, I, I found that fascinating. And they're not dying as in they're depriving themselves. They reach a point where uh, it's a mental exercise where you say I don't crave food at all. So it's not like I'm denying myself food. It goes through a series of uh, practices which I find fascinating because we all talk about feasting. Yes. We talk about different kinds of food. Uh, but the idea of using fasting uh, to uh, on a spiritual journey is something which is fascinating me. And I thought that yeah, would be yeah. an interesting conversation. Correct. Exactly. And I think the, the, the fasting feasting cycle per se, right? I mean, the feast always comes after the fast. And the longer the fast, the more elaborate and richer uh, the feast. Um, and, and to your point, I think the, even in Karnataka, like you mentioned, you know, the, uh, the Shravana Belagola, right? Yes. I mean, the, the, that, in those Bela. are Jain. Yeah. So, and it's also said to be where Chandragupta Maurya Chandra has set Maurya to start so, himself. Yeah. Uh, Karnataka has a very strong Jain history in the 8th century, the Rashtrakutas who ruled Karnataka and much, uh, much of North India. Uh, North India doesn't know much about South Indian history as we know, but, uh, the Jain history of Karnataka so is something... does not know South India. Yeah. History and all. <laughs> so that's, yeah. You can insert X there, right? Yes. That, I, I mean, I, yeah. the more you engage, the more you realize how yeah. little they... Uh, yeah. But the point is that 
the idea of Jainism, but I was shocked that many of my friends who were Jain from North India did not know, although they knew of the ceremony, the Shaman Belagola ceremony, yes. which happens once in 12 years. I would say, but do you know there are Basadis around Manipal, around uh, Mangalore, and there are these beautiful stone structures. And you know, it's very important that these, they're always located on top of stone. And the reason is, because st nothing grows on stone. Yeah. So it is no vanaspati. There is no plant life. So if there's no plant life, there is no animal life, there is no food. So they are reinforcing through this idea. But what is interesting, if you look at the Jain images of the Tirthankaras and the Bahubali images, and uh, if you go to Madurai, outside Madurai, even Tamil Nadu has a very strong, very, 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 very strong Tamil yes. uh, uh, Jain culture. So the culture. Amman temple, the Kanchipuram temple, temple. the uh, Ilango Adigal who wrote uh, Silapadigaram, they're all, I mean, Ilango Jain. Adigal is said to have been Jain. And yeah. the Samanar Hills, which is outside, is really Shramana Hills. Yes. And if you go uh, on top of the hill, you see these images of the Jain uh, sages. They are fasting, but they all are relatively plump. And it's very important to understand why is an artist, he's, he's talking about someone who's fasting, right? We have images of the Buddha who fasts, and I don't know if you've seen the image of Buddha, which is very Kankala Sharira. He's completely lost weight, and then Sujata comes and gives him food. But in the Jain thing, they will say these, these sages would fast, but they would not lose the luster of their body. It's a very important idea, because they did not deprive themselves of food. They said, can we outgrow hunger? It's a different conversation. It is Definitely. not that I don't want food. It is, I don't want, I don't, I, I want to kill this desire. And that's a very different way of being. And I think that idea, it's just an idea uh, in a world which is so consumption obsessed. Uh, and in India, uh, you know, food becomes an, again, a metaphor because consumption creates debt. Yes. You know, let me explain this concept. The idea is uh, all living organisms need to eat, right? They all need to eat. But because you eat, you go into rin, which is debt. How do you repay this debt? The plant gets eaten by someone else. The animal gets eaten by someone else. So the eater gets eaten. So jivo jivatsya jivanam. It's a very famous line which is used everywhere. But with humans, what does it happen? We eat, we consume, but do we repay the debt to nature? Like right now, this climate change and all people are talking about, we are plundering ecosystems. But the, the, the Indian idea was, how do you repay this debt? Right. And the Jain said, you know, what if I don't incur this debt? I don't want to incur this debt at all. And therefore, fasting becomes important. And now these are ideas which are very valuable in the 21st century, which is so obsessed with consumption. Right. Like consume, consume, consume. So be in debt, debt, debt. And debt creates naraka. It create, takes you down. And they're saying, no, no, we want to go up to Siddha, Siddhalaya. Up. And the only way to do it is by fasting. So it's not just the act of food and the act of fasting, but it's also ideas around it, which are very deep. And I find it very exciting. You know, you can move from the basic yes. of Jain food uh, exactly, you know, right. and talking about Jain pizzas yes. and then suddenly the conversation goes to a very high level and then it can come back to this uh, pleasurable spaces. You know, it's, it's interesting because I think uh, one, of, one of the things about your work that I've always found interesting and I find parallels to uh, what I do on say Instagram debunking food myths and so on. Uh, I'm often told that you know what, you, you are, uh, you know, using science to, you know, beat down religion. And I'm like, no, I'm not, right? Um, my only point is that you can be spiritual. You can believe in the things that you believe about food for spiritual reasons. Uh, but what you don't get to do is to then look at somebody else's choices and say, you're not allowed to eat that. Yeah, yeah. So that's the only thing. So I wanted to sort of bring this point about uh, a lot of food ideas in Jainism as well. So you spoke about the idea of going away from food as a thing that you desire to eat to something that you perhaps eat when you need to eat for sustenance. And to that end, the idea of having all these rules, right? So that has always been fascinating to me, right? So the fact that you will not eat things that are grown underground, yeah. right? Uh, no onion, garlic, you know, potato, carrot, radish, and so on. And yet, curiously, I think sometimes people will say, hey, but what about turmeric and ginger? Yeah. They do eat turmeric and ginger. Yeah. Those are also roots. Um, and so people have these gotcha moments that you say yes to brinjal, which has seeds. But what about tomato, which also has seeds? Do you not eat? So, so in that sense, is there, a, um, is there a way of thinking about and separating out these sort of gotcha ways of thinking about food versus... 
see uh, nowadays uh, all conversations are about combat yeah right like if you look at twitter is combat yes. nobody has conversations anymore yes, we have no, combat yeah. yes like, and and the, and basically the in my opinion the worst feature of twitter that they introduced ever is the quote tweet because i am having a conversation with you a quote tweet is i'm me doing this to my audience say look at what he is saying right so that's basically what a quote tweet is right well, and it is really encouraged everyone to posture rather than converse yeah you know tv channels actually take videos do reaction videos and call it debate <laughs> yes i have been a victim of that where a reaction video has been called a debate you know so um, but that's the point is when you start using food to position yourself oh look i am pure and pious because i eat banana that's a very sad place to be that your ego needs banana to stand on exactly yeah I Bangalore audience, Instagram savvy, so eating banana may be misconstrued, but yes, I'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, please go ahead, yes. I will not talk about cringe all. <laughs> It's non-Jain, so we are okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, the, the, see, the idea of consumption, coming back to consumption, the act of consumption is considered violence. Yes. Hinsa. So, what is hinsa? Hinsa is not about eating vegetarian food, makes me ahinsa. the idea is any act of consumption is violence so how do i make a community aware that don't if you want to genuinely reduce violence in the world you have to consume less how do i communicate this you don't tell people you do it ritually you perform it you perform it regularly by saying you will consciously be aware of where your grain come from where does your meat come from right. and be aware of the violence of the world we live in there is no escaping violence yep. because you are going to consume as a living organism we will all consume but be aware that your act of consumption is violent there is no escape you cannot say ki main vegetarian hu और मैं एयर कंडीशन घर में रह के आई एम अहिंसा द कंजम्पशन ऑफ इलेक्ट्रिसिटी इज डिस्ट्रॉइंग लार्ज पार्ट्स ऑफ द नो इवन मोर बेसिक राइट आई मीन दिस समबडी पॉइंटेड आउट रिसेंटली दैट इफ यू ईट वन चिकन यू ईट वन चिकन वन चिकन गिव्स इट्स लाइफ इफ यू ईट सम राइस यू नीड एकर्स ऑफ राइस फील्ड्स टू 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 ग्रो दैट यू हैव टू मर्डर हंड्रेड्स एंड थाउजेंड्स ऑफ एनिमल्स टू मेक श्योर दैट देयर आर नो रैट्स देयर आर नो लिजर्ड्स देयर इज नॉट नो बर्ड्स नथिंग can eat that rice you have to murder all the other plants to unnaturally grow one crop so agriculture per se itself, itself is, is violence. violence in that sense right see yeah. this is one of the reasons why the jain community went to trading they outsourced the violence <laughs> exactly yes but you see even then they are being told you know that is the shravaka the ordinary guy doing it ideally you should not consume and therefore the holy man the holy man is someone who does not consume so i have met jain monks who eat once in two days and they are very and they keep telling me that it's a practice i have been doing this for 10 years today and my is it the way 24 by 7 you think about mythology yeah i think 24 by 7 how to fast correct he's not posting instagram reels on intermittent he fasting he's not trying to post <laughs> and he is not saying oh look at me i am such a wonderful person people around him keep saying sir ye na he has eaten only once in two days and they positioning him and i can see his embarrassment he's cringing he is like this is my practice this is my adhyatma i am not here to position myself i don't want a selfie saying not eaten food for two days <laughs> that's not the point it's my personal private journey with my atma and i think these are the wise men that i have met in india which really tell you that this is what makes our country these people who don't need uh, they are doing their thing and they are explaining these ideas they, they come from business families they come from great wealth and they are like we have done that we have lived but we want to experience this now you want to experience television you want to i want to experience what my what happens to my body when i fast how much can i resist what will i eat so they eat standing they eat with one hand they will not look they will stand up they will not use utensils 
So there is a lot of, and it gets worse, I, mean, you know, I will say worse, but for them it just gets better and more refined and more refined and more refined. And I find that fascinating. In a world where you have, you know, we talk about food and pleasure, which has its place. So you have this world of Kama Shastra, where food is pleasure and you, you know, Naivedya. When you give Naivedya to the gods, you're giving the facet, Chappan Bhog. The same country is producing a group of people who are saying, I don't want to have bhog at all. And, and very well aware that the act of bhog is the act of consumption, is the act of violence. And I think this is very interesting because you have both these shades and the country says, you know, all of this is required. Some, depending on your karmic status, you decide whether you want to enjoy your meal, you want to be a glutton, there is a Bakasur. Yes. But there is also someone who says, there is a Bahubali who says, I don't want to eat. So, you know, you have the entire range of characters from Bakasur to Bahubali. Yeah. And not, not, Bahubali. not a Telugu movie. Bahubali. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just had to clarify because I'm saying non violence and I'm saying Bahubali. And they're like, <laughs> so people what must are you be talking like, about? Right. And it's Bakasur also has some biryani restaurant somewhere in here, I guess, right? That also is there, yes. Uh, you know, or movies like Animal. So, you know, so these kind of. <laughs> You, you can't, you know, violence has taken new forms. Absolutely. Uh, but you know, for me, I always tell people when the goddess cooks, you know, Annapurna, they say Annapurna, the goddess Annapurna is also Durga, right? She's the goddess of the battlefield. And it's strange, right? Why would the goddess of the kitchen be the goddess of the battlefield? Because, and I keep saying, have you ever seen cooking? Because it is chopping, crushing, mincing, you know, mud. Yes. Uh, you, you are frying and boiling yeah. and roasting. Yes. Someone and you know, qu quite interestingly, right? You know, one of the things I keep saying is that when you, when you buy meat, it, it, is, it is dead. The cells are dead by, when the animal died. Because that's, a, that's the definition of an animal. It needs a central yeah. you know, circulatory system and all that. So when the animal dies, the, the cells die, it's dead. The plant is still alive. So when you chop an onion is when those cells die and it, the onion is trying to tell you don't kill me by giving you an acid attack to your yeah. eyes and everything it either is killed in the act of chopping or in the act of heating right so when it comes to a plant the butchery is happening right in your kitchen you know the spices so please remember that next time you eat veg biryani no i always <laughs> No, the spices were created by plants to yes. protect themselves exactly. from being killed. We make it to make the act of eating more desirable. Exactly. And the irony is lost on everybody except plants. Exactly, yes. <laughs> but I must tell you, talking about plants, there is a story from the Jaimini Brahmana. Now, the Brahmanas have uh, old Itihas stories, which are even predate Ramayana Mahabharata manuscripts. So, Ramayana Mahabharata manuscripts are about 2,000 to 1,000 uh, years. I'm, I'm expecting a Twitter thread challenging that in, yeah, in okay. the next five minutes, but please continue. Yeah, yes. we can always say it was 5,000 years ago and <laughs> 5,300 yes, yes. years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, whatever date makes you comfortable. Yes. But the story is interesting. <laughs> Correct, yes. You know, so the story is important because Jayamini, uh, Brahmana story is told in many of the Brahmanas. The Brahmanas are the prose sections of the Vedas. The Vedas have two sections, poetry and prose. The poetry is called mantra and the prose is called Brahmana. So uh, Brahmana Granth has these stories and one of the stories uh, repeated many times is of a sage called Bhrigu. And Bhrigu uh, goes on this journey. It's a mystical journey. Some say it's a dream. Some say he's dead, but he goes to the other world. We're not very clear what it is, but he goes on this journey and it's a long journey, but I'll tell you two incidents that he experiences. He sees humans eating humans. So he sees cannibalism, but in one scene, he sees the humans being eaten are screaming like animals. Another group of humans that have been consumed are screaming, but the shout is silent. They can't hear the sound. So he comes back and he's talking to his father. He's talking to God. He's speaking to Varuna. And he asks, what is this strange sight that I saw? And his father or God or whoever the deity is tells him, you know, everything you eat will eat you one day. So, bhog bhogi banega. Jo bhogi hai, wo bhog banega. And if you have eaten an animal, that animal is going to eat you the next life and you will scream like that animal. So that is why you're shouting like those animals is the first shot you see. The second is all the plants you ate are now going to eat you. But since when the plant screams, there's no sound coming, you can't hear the sound in the second case. 
Now, these are Vedic stories which are telling about the living animal and the living plant. The living animal is screaming and a scream that you can hear and the living plant which is screaming, whose scream you cannot hear. These are Vedic ideas. Yes, yeah. So, it's interesting because I think, you know, uh, there's a... I'm sure maybe Douglas Adams might have borrowed this idea from here. <laughs> but, uh, so there's a, there's a scene in the restaurant at the end of the universe where there's a concept uh, called the dish of the day. So the concept is that the, the dish of the day basically features the animal that you're about to eat will come to your table, have a conversation with you. It's, be, it's a genetically modified animal that can speak and all of that. And it'll, so what, what would you like me to do? Would you like a fillet? Would you like a steak? Whatever, right? And then, then, and then people choose what they want. And then I'll say, I'll go off, kill myself. And you know, they will make a fantastic dish with me. So this is a, a scene. And then obviously the first time humans come experience that they're like shocked. It's like, how can I eat an animal that is talking to me at the table, right? And, and, and he says, no, sorry, I'll just have a salad. And the, the animal actually says, I know some plants who disagree with that. <laughs> so <laughs> so in, in, in that sense, I think, you know, um, what fascinates me about the larger Jain worldview, uh, the metaphysical view, not the not worry about whether Bengan is Jain or not, or Jain pizza and all of that, um, is, the, is the recognition that, uh, that one, all life is equal, right? Um, in that plants are as alive as, as animals. So therefore, the true idea of, uh, of food has to be that you fundamentally have to recognize that it's all ahimsa. You're trying to minimize it uh, by eating few things and not eating some things and eating only when you uh, kind of eat it and so on. Which brings me to my next question about this tension between the metaphysics and the grammar of spirituality versus the metaphysics and the syntax of say science and mathematics. And why in today's world, let's say for the last 200 years, there's been a bit of this tension, more so in the West to be honest. I find Indians yeah. to be quite comfortable sending a rocket to space using Newtonian mechanics and Einsteinian relativity, and then also breaking a coconut yeah. for it to make sure that it doesn't fail, right? And so we are comfortable doing both, and there is something special about the fact that we are able to do it. So I want, sort of wanted to get your take on that. Yeah, so uh, what happened, what, when we say Western society and colonized mind, these are words which are used a lot nowadays by people who don't understand it. Usually they use the word because what is Western society or colonized mind? It is when you start believing there is only one truth. Only one truth. So it's, I have one life, I have to live the right way. There is only one way of living and that's one truth. And that's the Western way. So Western, the, and hence the need to sell the idea. The need to debate the idea. The need to constantly argue. And, and evangelize. And, and evangelize. And just say that I am right. And if you see, it doesn't ex uh, remain restricted to religious practices. It is in science. We are trying to evangelize science. You see the way Richard Dawkins talk. He's talking like a missionary. My way is the right way. And I'm like, why are you getting so agitated? Yeah. It's science. <laughs> Yeah. It's, you know, science should calm you down because you're just looking at numbers and data and it shouldn't agitate you because you are agitated because you want to convince people. Yeah. This one truth is the hallmark of the colonized mind and therefore debate. I, you, I always tell people I never like participating in debate, but debate is a Western idea. Vivad. Yes. Indians are Sambad. Sambad yes. We like to talk, dialogue, listen, listen to other ideas, which means there is a scientific way of looking at the world and there is a spiritual way of looking at the world. And now let me explain the difference between the two. I am hungry and I, therefore I want food. So my hunger and food, does food exist without hunger? Is the question you have to ask. If there was no hungry person in the world, food wouldn't exist. So food and hunger are related, but... I can measure food. I can't measure hunger. Now, a, a very famous minister talked about hunger, 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 and that how can you measure it? What we measure in science is the outcome of the... Uh, if you stay hungry for a long time, the malnourishment, the underdevelopment that right. happens, you can, you can measure. So, science is basically about measuring food. And spirituality is about coping with hunger. And hunger is, and the West thinks, if I give you food, hunger will go away. And again, I, sorry, I'll tell a story uh, to explain this idea. 
where uh, one day Kubera, the god of wealth, with all the money in the world, goes to Kailas Parbat and he sees Ganesha sitting over there and he looks at Ganesha and says, Ganesha, you look quite plump and happy. And clearly your father has no income. You know, he is digambara and covered with ash and has snakes all over him. So he has no food. He can't feed you. So what do we do? I want to take you to my house and I'm going to feed you. Bharpet khana dunga. So, um, bharpet khana dunga. So what he does is he uh, invites Ganesha to his house and starts serving food. And Ganesha keeps eating everything until he completely finishes off the pantry. And he keeps eating more and more. He says, Aapne bola na, bharpet khana khilaoge. And then Kuber says, you're trying to communicate something. He says, you know why I sit next to Shiva? Because Shiva doesn't give me food. He tells me how to manage hunger. Life is about... Yeah. Because hunger, we don't use the word hunger today. We use the word ambition. Yeah. We don't say, I am Bakasur. I say, I'm ambitious. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So consumption, consumption, consumption. Yeah. But contentment, conversations on contentment don't happen. Business schools don't, because they're talking about food. Science is about food. And religion, spirituality is about not food. Unfortunately, people say, I want more money, I want more. You'll see all these rich people in temples. Yeah. If you put a CCTV camera, they look so hungry. You want to take money out of your pocket and give it to them and say, eat. As you said, there's no app for jealousy and coping no with anxiety. There is no app for uh, jealousy, right? I can't measure your jealousy. Although I, actually, if you don't use Instagram, you will be less jealous and anxious. <laughs> that is also there, yes. So, the spirituality, I mean, so this is the dichotomy. The West doesn't understand this. They're looking for one solution. Science will solve all problems. Science does not solve. It, it does, never promised to solve all problems. It explains the world to you. Yeah. No, it's, it's quite interesting that even in the, even in science, right, uh, it is sometimes surprising how even public communicators of science forget that if you just think about the world, there are things that are deterministic, meaning that you can apply an equation and come to a binary answer or an answer. This will be there at that point of time if it travels at this velocity. And there are things that are stochastic truths. Stochastic truths are basically things that are true or false only on aggregate, like thermodynamics and so on. So, so the point is that it is possible for you to embrace the stochastic, more uncertain way of thinking. You know, there is quantum physics and so on. So there are, way, there are ways in which you can embrace it. But as I said, I think the, the cultural part, the monotheistic cultural part of that overrides and it actually affects the way you do science as well. Yeah. And I think that's something we are understand that you see, we are talking about how the, you know, a scientist who talks about going to the moon and going to Mars can also go to the temple and break a coconut. Because he knows that no matter how much I do, how much hard I do, things can go wrong. There is no, there, to, for certainty, I have my calculations. But for uncertainty, I need my prayers. I need your faith. Yeah. Right. And again, and to be clear, it's not that that person believes that me doing that will absolutely make my rocket uh, reach the moon. Yeah, right. you know, Krishna, uh, you know, I always give this example of Krishna. Krishna, who's Purushottama, what does he say? Now, uh, so just indulge me on this. When you ask people, what is the definition of karma? They will say, as you sow, so you reap. Or they'll say, karma happened to him. Karma. They actually use this lines, as you sow. Now, this line comes from the Bible. Yes. It's not from any Indian scripture. As you sow, so you reap, which is predictable, which is very scientific. You do this, you get this. Yeah. Krishna says, Phalki chinta mat karo, which means even God is not giving you guarantee in India. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Nothing is guaranteed. Yes. I realized this. I realized this when I did all that fasting and exercise and there was no weight loss. <laughs> <laughs> Most of that is genetics, which anyway is the most random of all things. Yeah. yeah, and nobody wants to talk about that because, you know, you can do it if you work hard. And you look at this American, uh, those coaches, yeah. that it is all about hard work and they get very, again, evangelical about it. Yes. And I think this evangelism is a very Western trait. And I think in food matters. Nowadays, we are seeing evangelists in every reel, right? Everybody is coming up with this. And I love your reels because you talk about and remind, like, what, what is that? Uh, uh, 
you should eat haldi is better and uh, milk is better but pasta is bad and they come up with these strange ideas and because somebody yesterday was washing a liver model with haldi and saying that he was washing it in this cam and it was a doll and he said the way i'm washing this liver they were and i'm like it doesn't work like this <laughs> you would be dead <laughs> you would you would yes, be do this if you cut open your liver you start doing it it's like one of those veera veera stories no they yes. cut open their stomach and you know this tamil heroes when this melodramatic yeah, yeah, voice yes, they yes, cut open yes. their stomach and they'll put haldi inside yeah <laughs> no don't do that. Please, please do not try it at home do please. not try this at yes, home <laughs> Yes, so, you know this is something that people i think we take the we forget the purpose of mythology yeah and the purpose of science one is exp- explaining the material measurable world the other is dealing with your imagination which is real you you imagine problems you are wondering that one day i'll become so beautiful that the prince charming will come to meet me and marry me until he discovers my horrible personality you know so the whole process is in your imagination ultimately the boy will marry you because papa is going to give dowry yeah it's right. as simple as that you get fast yeah. as much as you want yeah but ultimately the check is going to decide yeah so there was a an interesting thing that happened a while back um an aunt of mine uh, now retired used to be a teacher used to be a science teacher physics teacher um and uh, family whatsapp group as usual there's all kinds of nonsense being shared uh typically by uh, uh, nri uncles so yeah. that's usually the very likely that maximum misinformation is spread from overseas <laughs> never from the states okay so and uh, and, and so there's a random bunch of misogynist jokes many things being shared etc etc and then i you know i would occasionally you know try to say that why are you doing these things and so on and then i would ask this lady you you're a science teacher why don't you call out some of this scientific misinformation people used to say all kinds of random stuff about food and she said something interesting she said look i might be scientific in fact you know i believe in science i'm a science teacher etc etc right uh, but i'm part of this group i'm part of this family if i start arguing along these lines it doesn't mean that somehow all you cool atheist young kids will now become my friends i will now find a new community it doesn't work that way this is the only community and this is the group i have if i if i am not part of this i don't get to go to temples with them i don't get to go to kashi with them and so i think it suddenly woke me up to the fact that spiritual identity community identity no matter how simplistic it might seem to you is absolutely essential for a lot of people right and on a lighter note my my grandmother used to say this about uh, uh, she would go back to the village some of the older men would say a lot of exceedingly very silly bigoted things and so on i would say how did you put up with all of these people uh, she said that no in in our days what we used to do is that once a man reaches 60 years old it's best to stop listening to him <laughs> they usually do <laughs> so that is how my grandmother used to deal with so in that sense i think I, maybe i think given the amount of time we have yeah we have time, nine minutes then we'll questions one last point about how should the current generation that is growing up in a world that is so filled with misinformation uh, temptation you know uh, dopamine hacking from all of your smartphone apps and uh, the sort of crisis between you probably did not grow up with that strong mythological identity forming that maybe your parents and your grandparents grew up with right how should how should people think about that in today's world uh, so everybody lives in a mythological world it's just that they're not aware of it or they have not read my books yet <laughs> <laughs> I like the fact that you might be mythological and spiritual but you're still a free market person. <laughs> <laughs> no the point is uh w- mythology is a cultural truth. It's uh, and we forget when we talk about NRI uncles the reason is they they are connect with India is through fighting for haldi fighting for basmati because in that lonely streets of Manhattan nobody looks at them. Yeah. But on WhatsApp group they are the heroes fighting for turmeric. Yes. I mean that is this is a hero so one has to give them that the point is we forget things like identity and every human being is looking for identity and identity only comes from mythology it doesn't come from science science won't give you mythology will yeah. science at best will tell you you're a homo sapien you are x chromosome y chromosome it will tell you this is the body and this is how much proteins you have fats you have carbohydrates you have 
it is not able to tell you that you are a special person, you are a nice person, you are a friend. These are what is created by relationships. And, you know, food is what binds us together. Fasting binds us together. Um, we eat together. We uh, go out with friends to eat, let's say, Pani Puri or we go to a temple or a festival when for one month everybody is vegetarian. That one month nobody is going to consume alcohol and you're all saying, oh God, this whole month I'm not going to have alcohol. In, in Maharashtra, there is Shravan is the time when there's something called Gattari Ekadashi when everybody rushes to go to the... Because for one month you're not going to have... So these are uh, social things. So... For the new generation, I always say that you are not escaping from mythology. I'll give you a food metaphor of what is mythology at a, you know, s s we all agree the objective reality is we all need carbohydrates, fats, proteins, minerals. We need to eat that. Yes. But the cultural truth is in what form should I give it to you? Should I give it to you as a roti? Should I give it to you as a pasta? Should I give it to you as a noodles? You could talk to a Vietnamese or person. Or Jain Mexican or falafel. Or Jain Mexican falafel. falafel. Yeah. 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 Yes. You know, so... <laughs> Which form is the right form? The body says, I want, so long as you give me carbohydrates, fats, proteins, I'm fine. Yeah. You have decided, I want to give it in roti form, meri maa ki roti, meri gaon ki roti, this uh, millet roti. So you do whatever you want. Because your identity comes from that food. Your, a Vietnamese will say, pho is better. Yeah. The Italian will say, pasta is better. Now, those are the cultural truths we have to live with. So scientific truth is objective. But cultural truth is subjective. It gives you these different truths. And how should you eat the food? Should I eat it with fingers? Should I eat it with a fork and knife? Yeah. It doesn't matter to your body. Yeah. You can shove it into your mouth. If it goes into your stomach, it doesn't care. You will say, oh, it is Bhagavan and I will chant these songs before eating. It doesn't your matter. stomach doesn't care. Yes. Absolutely doesn't, yes. You know, it yeah. is... In it's, Marat the, it's, it's acid of pH 1 or 2 that's just there to kill bacteria. So in Marathi, there's a line. They say, Pratham Potoba Mag Vitoba. First the stomach, then God. Yes. That is why even when you go to the temple, you'll first give God food. Naivedya. Yes. Before you ask for prasad. Yes. And also why, when I first went to North India, when people said, today I'm fasting, and then they would eat sabudana and a lot of other <laughs> random deep fried food, it was confusing. But again, it's, it goes back to this idea that it's the... It's the spiritual identity of the fact that... It's your cultural thing. It's like if you go to... In Bombay, there are restaurants which will say fasting food, food. available here. Yes. Upas ka khana yaha milega. Explain this to someone in the rest of the world. Exactly. This is India with its upai. You can talk great civilization, this, that, but ultimately... We, we're the civilization of Jugad. Absolutely. Yes. You know, Vishnu ko khana chahiye, yes. Vishnu ko makhan chahiye, Shivji ko kacha dud chahiye. So you have every god having very clear food preferences. So you, that you get all of it, right? That's and goddess is very clear. Tum log veg khao, merko bali chahiye. Absolutely, yes. And North India you go, they will have Durga Puja, the Navratri is vegetarian time. Bengalis are aghast. Like, exactly. what is yes. this nonsense? You eat deem, you have to eat. I remember taking my Punjabi friends to right. Durga Pandal in Bombay. Yes. And the aunt had a nervous breakdown because I said, Auntie, you want to eat chicken chops? Yes. And mutton chops? The Devi ko, but man, the puja is happening over there. So we're going to give it to her also. Yeah. I think yes. she said, Ye kya log ho tum log? <laughs> And you know, it's something that I keep saying, please understand, Shiva's vehicle is a bull. It is vegetable grass. Goddess has a tiger. Likes meat. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. He, she is Annapurna. She or the bull. Either. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She, or the bull. <laughs> Annapurna loves to cook. Shiva says, I am fasting. And they are living together happily. Now that's good marriage. It's best actually. Yes. Because otherwise, if, if you then husband and wife go to a restaurant, and if one person wants Jane falafel sizzler, and the other person wants meat, then there's a problem. Yeah. And you have restaurants which will satisfy both. Exactly. Aap yes. ke liye bhi, sir, and we will, you can carry your own spoons. <laughs> because we have Jain spoons too. <laughs> which is purer than your vegetarian food. <laughs> because even in the vegetarian world, there's a hierarchy. Absolutely, yes. Right? Are you pure, purer than the pure, more pure than the pure? <laughs> You know? No, so I've done a cartoon once. So there's, there's basically the ultra pure, only home cooked food. E will eat only at pure veg restaurants. 
we'll eat at we'll eat veg food in non veg restaurants that is the next level then we'll occasionally eat egg because i don't get protein and then goes abroad i'm okay to eat chicken but not anything else and then finally last category is what i call mallu christian will eat everything so so this is the hierarchy of <laughs> so <laughs> let no, me that's truly the only group of people in india who have no dietary restrictions so let me tell you this case which happened in the usa so i wanted to eat in uh, the mcdonald's burger the proper burger big mac in america it was a dream of mine it didn't occur to me that it's beef yes so it was little when i ate because you you're conditioned right you're like yeah. i ate and then i looked at my friend he said oh indian cow nahi hai <laughs> upai he cleared my problem a1 cow no nope. yeah perfect it's okay no <laughs> see a1 cow don't drink milk eat the meat that is i just meat. add and my friend happened to be a jain So I'm just saying this is how you adapt yes life culture relationships Indeed. because food is about joy and fasting is about discovering the joy even that is about a joy each activity is about anand yes. if it doesn't give you anand then you please go to an arnab show